Sam and Ryan followed in the footsteps of Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who between 1804 and 1806 led a famous expedition to explore and advance our knowledge of the West. A little about our presenters. Stan, who will present tonight both as himself and as Meriwether Lewis, is a history buff and the author of a book on Theodore Roosevelt. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Connecticut and a retired business executive. Ryan, who will present both as himself and William Clark this evening, lives in Newtown and is an IT professional for software company. And now before we get started, a couple very quick notes. For those of you on Zoom tonight, um, you are a vital part of our program and we do want to hear from you. Please feel free to type your questions and comments into the Q&A section, section um, at any time. And we will be addressing your questions at the end of this program. Also, we are recording, uh, and so look for it in about a week on the library's YouTube channel. Now, I would like to turn things over to Stan and Ryan, AKA Lewis and Clark. Thank you both. It's a pleasure okay. to have you with so hopefully there's a lot of mics here and I'm in the right place at the right time. But my wife is here just in case and she's gonna direct me in the right uh, spot to sit and stand. So anyway, welcome uh, to everybody here and everybody in Zoom land. I understand there's about 50 people or so, 40 or 50 uh, online. Um, as you can tell, we do have uh, you know shirts on which we, get, you know, we actually did wear on our trip, which was a nine day trip. Um, Yep, uh, you know, he's Clark and I'm Lewis. Uh, it was a nine day trip and uh, you'll see a bunch of slides here. Uh, and I've got about four or five videos that we took, you know, during the trip, which was in the month of August, 2015. So about seven years ago. Uh, we've done this three other times in Bethel, Brookfield and Danbury. So we thought we'd share it to Reading as well. And uh, they were very kind to, uh, invite us in. So let me tell you a little bit about um, their experience and then we'll get into the slides here. We do wanna to keep to uh, about an hour in, uh, including Q and A. And there'll be some people uh, I'm sure online who have Q and A as well. Uh, their trip took 18 months. Ours took nine days. <laughs> um, there were um, about 31 people on the Corps of Discovery, which was, uh, uh, you know, the official name of the uh, expedition. Uh, we calling ourselves the Corps of Discovery part two. So that's the difference between that. They had a large keel boat, which is probably a 40 or 50 large canoe that, you know, could fit all of these men and supplies on that boat. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. But what we did have was a 2014 Chevy Impala, <laughs> which made us kind of, you know, go along the river as well as climb over 9,000 feet into the Rockies and then back down the Rockies to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so people ask, why did we do this, right? I think that's a legitimate question. It was kind of a father and son thing. Uh, I, you know, let's call it a bonding trip. I always used to say to Ryan, in his former job that he used to travel the globe and he actually did circumnavigate the globe on one trip i remember uh you know going to europe instead of coming back to a trip he had to go to california he went all the way around the other way and uh but you know having traveled myself quite a bit you never really get to see you know what's uh, on the ground or if you're in a hotel room or in a conference room or whatever so i said why don't we do this it was uh 2015 several years after the uh the 200th anniversary of uh, the core of discovery. So there was a lot of you know, you know, publicity about it. And I read the book, by the way, if anybody's interested, uh, it's been out a while, but this is probably the, you know, the Bible of you know, Lewis and Clark's trip by Stephen Ambrose. It's a New York Times bestseller. And it's got a lot of detail there, which uh, you know, in effect goes beyond what we're gonna talk about here. Um, so the other part of it is that, you know, Lewis and Clark actually kept a journal of their trip, two to three year trip. And as I was mentioning to some of the people here, that journal was almost lost to, you know, posterity. Um, some obscure professor, I, don't, I forget who, actually got his hands on it around 1850 and resurrected it to the point that he annotated it, 
put it into a published, uh, you know, format and got it published. And from that point forward, a lot of people knew a lot of the details that, uh, in effect, nobody really knew. And we're going to quote from, uh, you know, the journal themselves to give you a little sense of what they went through. Um, so one final point before I get going. Much of what is, exists today on this trail that we took, and we didn't see everything by any means, uh, but we saw enough, and uh, is really you know, run by the National Park Service uh, at the federal level, as well as the, uh, the Department of Agriculture. And there are many state, uh, you know, states in the Dakotas, in Montana, Idaho, and Washington that also have their own either museums or interpretive centers that would explain really what you know, Lewis and Clark experienced themselves, the trials and tribulations that they had there. Um, but I wanted to read something uh, since I did write a book about, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, and I studied his life quite a bit. I'm a member of the Theodore Roosevelt Association as well. He said something here uh, because he was a great conservationist himself, but he said something here that I think is, you know, related to this trip that we took into the experience that you're having to, sh uh, to see this, that, uh, at the detail level that, uh, that you may not have really had the opportunity to do. So I'm just gonna quote you know, something from, a, it says, uh, defenders of the short-sighted men who in their greed and selfishness will, if permitted, rob our country of half of its charm by their reckless extermination of its useful and beautiful wild things, sometimes seem to champion them. Then by saying that, quote, the game belongs to the people, close quote, and so it does, not only to the people now alive, when he wrote this in uh, 1960, but to the unborn people. The greatest good for the greatest number uh, applies to the number of, within the womb of time, as well as our duty to the whole, including the unborn generations, you know, bids us to restrain an unprincipled present day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations. The movement for the conservation of wildlife and the larger the movement for the conservation of all our natural resources are essentially democratic in spirit, purpose, and method. So the way I look at this is that, you know, one of the reasons that we want to share this with you is that you, if, they, if he didn't really go to the extent that he did to create what ultimately was National Park Service and the whole conservation movement, the unborn, which are you and others who have you know, listened to this would never have seen this. And um, so I think it's, it's worthwhile to kind of mention, not to forget where it came from uh, and where it's gonna to continue to come from you know, going forward. So we'll go through the slides. And uh, you know, George is my tech support guy back there. So he's gonna come over and help with some of the videos. Um, okay, what should I do? <laughs> I'm pressing this button here. Is this uh, on the knee? I'm sorry. Um, I think I. Yeah. Okay. It's probably frozen. So, uh, this was uh, the itinerary we took. I won't go through all the details of this, but uh, you can see we started on you know August 19th and went through all uh, about you know 10 days later, kind of mapped out where we should be. So we were keeping to a schedule. And as I was talking to somebody in the audience, um, we uh, you know Ryan had to go to work in 10 days, so we had to be at a certain spot in Portland, Oregon, to catch a plane, and I was going to uh, to LA to a wedding. So we needed to make this trip at the set time. So there you see Clark on the left, you know, Lewis on the, on the right. This is us leaving, I guess it was LaGuardia Airport, right? Okay. So we're leaving LaGuardia at uh, that time. So here is just kind of give you some sense of what it was like in 1803. Um, actually, the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase was originally part of Spain's territory, even though they owned a lot of what is the West Coast there at the time but transferred it over, I'm not sure why, to France, uh, probably 20 or 30 years before it was purchased. But, you know, uh, Napoleon needed money in France because he was fighting a war against uh, 
uh, you know, Russia and uh, England, and uh, this use of the land was not meaningful to him. Uh, the only part of this territory that was meaningful was the port of New Orleans, which was a commercial center for uh, not only the United States, but also for France and other countries. So he sold it for $11 million or $15 million, which equates to about 50 cents a, a square acre, which is amazing. There are 15 states in that territory that exist today. And uh, you know, besides that, um, it is the breadbasket of the United States in the middle of the country. So it was a major undertaking, and it was part of Jefferson's, you know, Thomas Jefferson, who was president at the time, to uh, have a destiny of filling out the rest of the country, uh, which we ultimately did by uh, 1850 or so. Uh, but this was obviously a very large chunk of the territory. And you can see the Missouri River. So they started in St. Louis. It went all the way up north to Minnesota and then, uh, you know, due west. Uh, to the Rockies. Now, they did not know the, uh, that the Rockies existed. They thought they were going to have a water pathway to the Pacific Ocean. That was their goal. That's what Jefferson thought. And certainly, the Corps of Discovery had no idea that 10,000 foot peaks were in the way. So, we'll get to that in, in a little while. So, you know, Rapid City is where we, you know, you know landed. We went to, uh, to Mount Rushmore first. And um, just to you know, show you a few slides here of our time there. You know, how many of you have been uh, to, to Mount Rushmore? Okay, everybody should really go see Mount Rushmore. It really is quite a sight to see and behold. So Gustav Borglum was the sculptor and he sculpted these and he died before he completed it. Uh, but it was completed, I think around 1940 or so. These are just some additional photos on, you know, we got 90 slides here, so I gotta get through all these. Um, just different angles of them. It's a, now this is the Badlands of North Dakota, uh, of South Dakota, which was originally, you know, Native American territory. And I'll show you a little bit more about this. Uh, these are some, uh, you know, Borglum actually did some, I think these are either copper or some sort of metal figures that he used. He, he thought he was gonna do the entire figure or at least half the figure, but he only did the heads, with all the money he had for it. So after we left there, we went to this spot, which somebody said you should go see this, about 20 miles away from, um, uh, from the monument. So this is a sculpture in progress, and it's been going on since 1948. This is the head of a crazy horse. I believe it's a Sioux Indian. Uh, I uh, apologize if I'm not correct on that. But this has been going on and it's still going on as we speak. This sculpture, this is kind of an overlay of what it will ultimately look, uh, in effect, look like. This is a plaster of Paris of what it will look like. And What's interesting about this is that when it's done, it'll probably be four or five times the size of Mount Rushmore. And no one can figure out exactly when it's gonna end, uh, but there's a, a, a group of Native American tribes who will not take any public money or any private money from uh, any contributions. They wanna do this on their own. And um, this gentleman over here, Kozolowski, uh, who is, you know, was originally from Poland, wanted, was so you know, taken with I, you know, this idea that he actually helped uh, you know, the tribes put the sculpture in practice. And he and his succeeding children and children's children are still working on it today. And will probably continue working on this for the next 75 years by the time that they want to complete it. But it's quite an a impressive um, you know, monument. You can see the size of it up there. We also made a trip to, uh, you know, what was the name of this town? Uh, Deadwood? This is Deadwood. Yeah, so this is Deadwood, South Dakota. Uh, <laughs> John Wayne himself. Um, I like it. And um, then we also, you know, so we drove up to, from South Dakota, North Dakota, to a place called Madura. So Madura is a small little town in, in North Dakota where Theodore Roosevelt lived for several years. There's a beautiful national park there that we actually, uh, you know, visited. 
And uh, we're gonna, so in the park, we saw these little dolls sitting on a bench and my son will give you the backdrop to it. <laughs> Just a short story. This is uh, as we entered the uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Uh, one of the first places that you go to is a nice overlook, it's kind of a parking lot that you can pull into and then you get a whole kind of nice view of the opening of the park. So we pulled in and we kind of wanted to get our first view of the park. And uh, there was, uh, I think it was two friends there. It was two girls that were there. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, they're about my age or so. Uh, and they had these dolls with them. And uh, we got a little closer where you talked to them a little bit about it. These are uh, uh, X Files figures. These are uh, Mulder and Scully from the television show X Files. I was a I was a fan when I was a kid uh, watching the show. But they were traveling around and going to national landmarks and taking photos with them. So, so it was why, interesting. Uh, you know, we can't quite figure out why they wanted to do that, but we thought it might be a little. You know, when you, as I said, one of the purposes of our trip was to explore the West and, and see Americana. Uh, this is part of it. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is a it, it, it is really a, a, a painting of part of the park, um, but you can see some of the buffalo. So there's uh, some longhorn, uh, you know, rams and sheep there. There's buffalo. There's wild horses and mustangs and all kinds of wildlife that are in this park. It's a beautiful park. Uh, you can see this um, this little. Uh, uh, you know, guy was trying to block everybody going through. You have to wait for uh, for the buffalo to move along. Um, so, so one of the things in Medora, which is uh, right next to the park, in the summertime, this place comes alive. It's a small little town. Uh, during the winter and spring, it you now I don't know how many people live there. Maybe a hundred people. But in the summertime, it comes alive as a tourist attraction. So this fellow is, uh, you know, his name is Joe Wigan, who actually impersonates or reprises Theodore Roosevelt, puts on a show. And I've gotten to know Joe well over the years. So we watched his show and um, uh, he's greeting everybody who comes out there. Um, and um, it's also a very nice hotel there called the Rough Riders Hotel where I stayed one night. And then um, there's a golf course there called the Bully Pulpit, which is kind of interesting. Um, they also actually put on a show, uh, a very nice show. It was kind of a very patriotic show uh, every night during the summertime. And it's packed with people coming from all over the country or all over the world, uh, you know, to listen to it. And they do a song and dance and they talk about the country's uh, growth and this part of the world uh, uh, in the Midwest. It's, it's very nicely done, actually, very professional. So getting to Lewis and Clark. So, um, they went up the um, you know, Missouri to what is now Minnesota. And they stopped for the winter, 1803, um, in a, a village called the Mandan Village. The Mandans were a Native American tribe. And um, they spent the whole winter there. They became very friendly with them. And uh, they weren't, because the Missouri was going to freeze over in the winter, and they needed to stay there for two or three months. That's where they met Sacagawea. Now, Sacagawea, while she was there, also met a French trapper named Charbonneau, ultimately got married, and she's carrying her baby there. She actually took the baby on the trip with Lewis and Clark when they left the Mandan village and became indispensable to Lewis and Clark because she was kidnapped by the Mandans some years before from what was called the, what are called the Shoshone Indians, which is near the Rocky Mountains. And she had lived for many years here. She was probably only about 19 at the time they met her. But she wanted to reunite with her family in the Shoshones. And they, um, she was their guide. Now, one of the interesting little, this is a painting that was done around 1850 or 60. This is a fellow York. York is a slave. He was William Clark's slave. These are the Mandan Indians, and they talk about this in the journals, that the uh, uh, that Native Americans had never seen a black man before, never. And one of the, uh, you know, the tribesmen actually went up to York and was rubbing his hand on him to see if actually the blackness would come off. So you might say this was the first time that a red man met a black man. 
in 1803. And um, this is well documented uh, in the journals and I thought it would be interesting to show here. This is part of the, uh, what's the name of the? Uh, uh, Seaman. Seaman. Seaman is Clark's dog that he took on the trip. That's a little statue of him and that's the Missouri behind there. You could say William Clark looking down in Missouri a couple hundred years later, of course. Um, and here you see just another example of that. So as we go along here, we'll stop and see some different sites. This is probably from uh, one of the interpretive museums that we went to that talk about, um, with no running water, the stream was called the Big Dry Run. So this is in Montana and there's a big lake there now, but when they were there in 1803, it was, it, it, it was a dry bit, it was totally dry. And I don't know what happened over the years, but uh, it became a large uh, you know, reservoir today. So here is a story that, uh, that Mr. Clark is gonna read about Mr. Lewis. So as they were out into uh, the middle of nowhere, Lewis went out looking for game because they had to kill game for their own food and he encountered a grizzly bear. So it's talked about in the journal and he'll read what Mr. Lewis actually said. Okay, this is from the journal, uh, June 14th, 1805. I descended the hill and directed my course to the bend of the Missouri River near which there was a herd of at least a thousand buffalo. Here I thought it would be well to kill a buffalo and leave him until my return from the river. I selected a fat buffalo and shot him very well through the lungs while I was gazing attentively on the poor animal, discharging blood and streams from his mouth and nostrils, expecting him to fall every instant and having forgotten to reload my rifle, a large white or rather brown bear had perceived and crept on me within 20 steps before I discovered him. In the first moment I drew up, I drew up my gun to shoot but at the same instant recollected that she was not loaded and that, was, and that he was too near for me to hope to perform this operation before he reached me as he was then briskly advancing. It was an open plain, not a bush within miles nor a tree within less than 300 yards of me. The river bank was sloping and not more than three feet above the level of the water. In short, there was not means of concealing myself from this monster until I could charge my rifle. I began to run to the river, but the bear was gaining. The bear pitched at me, open mouthed and at full speed. The idea struck me to get into the water to such a depth that I could stand and he would be obliged to swim so I could defend myself with my espontoon knife. <laughs> at, the, at this instant, he arrived at the edge of the water within 20 feet of me. He suddenly wheeled about as if frightened, declined to combat on such unequal grounds and retreated with quite a great precipitation as he had just before pursued me. I now began to reflect on this novel occurrence. <laughs> and I felt myself a little gratified that he had declined to comment. My gun reloaded, I felt confidence once more in my strength. Thanks, thanks Bob. So uh, they had, you know, multiple, um, you know, multiple incidents like this, uh, but we thought we'd, you know, share that with you. Uh, just want to check. So here is what they, this is one of the you know, challenges they face. This is the Great Falls on the Missouri River. So you can imagine uh, they had a keel boat, right? So what are they gonna do with a keel boat up that? Can't go up that. So um, they had to go around it and they call that portaging. So this is in one of the museums. They had to take everything off the keel boat and use the small canoes so that they could put the canoes on the river upstream and um, they had to lug it through you know, various ways to do this, uh, to get everything up uh, together. We also um, went on this. So one of the you know, places that they came to in Montana was this big gorge of uh, the Missouri River cutting a large sculpture through these granite uh, cliffs. And we went on a boat tour there. So we, I, I have a video, a video. Congress enacted the Wilderness Act. Of course, when a Wilderness Act was initiated by Congress and signed by then President Lyndon B. Johnson, 
that set aside pieces of land to be protected. You'll find no roads, houses, or automobiles within a wilderness area. Very protected. There's a trail system throughout it, accessible by foot and horseback only. They don't even allow mountain bikes in wilderness areas. No. So that's just a short little clip. You know, I, I think we're going to come up to another one in a minute. So, uh, but these are just uh, this gives you kind of a more panoramic view of what uh, you know Lewis and Clark actually uh, saw. These are large granite and you know limestone mountains that you see here. It's also you know part of the National Historic uh, Parks today. So I think uh, there are some. I think you probably see kind of a speedboat on there now. Uh, but you can, uh, there are a bunch of trails that are going through this, but this is, this is part of Missouri actually go, you know, just, you know, cut through all of these mountains. Uh, history on foot, we kind of came to a very interesting point here and I, this will be, should be number two. Uh, yeah, so this is the, another, and you'll hear me speaking here because I'm talking to you for an iPad and uh, it's not the greatest quality, but we'll do the best we can. We are at the, the Lolo line? Pass, which is the actual trail that, that Lewis and Clark, Clark took to go over the, the, the mountains before they could get to the Columbia River. What you see here is the actual trail that Lewis and Clark took through these deep gorges and ravines in the forest. This is about a half a mile trail that will take you to a point where you can actually see the entire mountain ranges in front of you. But the footsteps that I am following are the actual footsteps that Lewis and Clark took. I will not make this entire half a mile trip because I'm not sure exactly where it leads to and we need to get on the road. But I thought whoever might want to see this would be interested in seeing what they actually went through and what we are repeating here on the Core of Discovery Part 2. It is part of the, uh, the reason why we took this trip to actually walk in the footsteps of this uh, this group of men who went through quite a bit of adversity to get to their final destination. And we will be at the Pacific Ocean in the next few days as they did. This is Lolo Pass, which is just, um, just at the beginning of what's called the Bitterroot Mountains, which is in the northern end of the Rockies, which is where they went over um, uh, to uh, so this is an interpretive site, and, and you see these along the, uh, uh, the different uh, you know, parts of the trip. Takajuia and her uh, tribe and family, you know, grew up in this area, which is probably at about uh, seven or eight thousand feet up in the mountains. And uh, I forget if this was in Idaho or in uh, in Montana, probably Idaho. But there was a big uh, display about her history and. Uh, this was a kind of a renewable energy. They've used a lot of, you know, a lot of the, uh, the natural resources for power plants uh, in this part of the world. And just some animals. These are supposedly, you know, original artifacts uh, from the trip that they took that are there. So this says Lewis and Clark on their way north, searching for a route over Idaho's mountain barrier, Lewis and Clark left this canyon and ascended a high ridge to reach the Bitterroot Valley, September the 3rd, 4th, 1805. And this is about 9,000 feet. And that's, that's one of the reasons we had an eight cylinder Apollo here, so we can get up the mountain. Um, so this, so when he came out of the Lolo Pass, Lewis saw this. This is a picture of what he saw. Had absolutely no idea that what he was looking at, other than the fact that he could not see anything beyond, you know, those mountain ranges. 
And um, see if I can find. That's looking wet. That's looking wet. So again, as I said earlier, they had no idea that that the Rockies existed. There were fur trappers who used to come down from Canada, a lot of French and and English. Uh, you, know, you know, Canada was pretty much owned by Britain and uh, France at the time. Um, and used to come down to, but no one from the colonies, the 13 colonies actually went this far. They went as far west as the Mississippi River, St. Louis. Anything on the other side was owned by either Spain or France at the time. And uh, this was kind of you know new to them. They thought they had a total waterway. So this is what we would call the continental divide, meaning that all of the water that comes down the Eastern slope of that uh, of, of the Rockies goes downstream. So they had to go upstream from the Missouri. Anything going on the west side of the Rocky Mountains you know, flows into what's called the Columbia River, which is downstream. So once they got over these mountains, which was no small task, they could go downstream on the Columbia, which would take them out to the Pacific Ocean. They had no idea how long it was going to take. Uh, this was probably about uh, August, September, and it was in their journals, they talk about it snowing at this level, uh, at this you know 9,000 foot level uh, in September. Uh, so, uh, but he talks about it, just bear with me one second. Uh, doesn't really write about it too much, but I'll quote from Ambrose here, but he quotes from the journals. To what degree Lewis was surprised or disheartened by this sight? He never said, John Logan Allen asked us to imagine the shock and the surprise. For from the top of that ridge were to be seen neither the great river that had been promised, nor the open plains extending to the shores of the South Sea or the Pacific Ocean, actually. What Allen calls the geography of hope had to give way to the geography of reality. With Lewis's last step to the top of the divide went, went you know, uh, decades of theory about the nature of the Rocky Mountains shattered by a single glance from a single man, equally shattered where Lewis's hopes for an easy portage to a major branch of the Columbia. But whatever Lewis felt as he saw the, uh, the Bitterroot Range here, he never wrote about it, nor did he write about his feelings as he took his first step on the western side of the Continental Divide. He descended the mountain, which was much steeper from the approach on the eastern side, about three quarters of a mile quote, to a handsome, bold running creek of, of cold, clear water. Here I first tasted the waters of the great Columbia River, meaning whatever water that was was going, uh, was going to flow down the western side of the mountains, which was going to fill the Columbia River, which is a really large river uh, in, that goes through Washington and Oregon. Um, so how did they get over this mountain? It's, they actually, used a guy named Toby from the Shoshone Indians. And no, no horses could get over this, uh, you know, these mountains. Toby took them the wrong way because he didn't know, he took them the way that he knew, I shouldn't say the wrong way, but the way that he knew. But there was a shorter way, which would have saved them three or four weeks of going. Now, keep in mind that there are no game at this height. They had to eat raw roots and plants, and a lot of them got sick, but it took them about three to four weeks to cross the mountains. And uh, we drove across it in about three hours. That's because I, you know, Highway 12 goes right through that. But you can imagine what they had to do to, uh, to have the stamina and the courage to continue this journey as they went forward. But we did, uh, you know, we did see these mountains, but they're, you know, uh, they're quite impressive. This is really where, you know, Lolo passes, and this is really, you know, taking you all through Idaho. It's a beautiful country that's that one. So we drove through uh, the Bitterroot Mountains. Happens to be, uh, what was it, uh, you know, late August, there were all kinds of wildfires going on. Very dry part of the, of, of the country. And we, um, this was kind of one smoke screen that we went through. We, sh we uh, you know, we turned on the air conditioner and uh, we shut all the vents, but you could smell the smoke coming right in here. And we were probably halfway through uh, the trip. There were probably another 50 miles to go. 
but we just sped it up. And uh, I did call the Ranger before we left. I think it was Missoula, you know, Montana, who was, who, uh, you know, there's a Ranger station and I actually spoke to him on the phone and he said that eh, just a little wildfire. Don't worry about it. Come on out. You know, obviously he sees it more than we do. Um, so when we stayed, I uh, forgot exactly what location, but we came out of the Bitterroots and you come into what is uh, the beginning of Wa the state of Washington, um, the eastern side of Washington. I say the western, on, I think, on the video. But we, uh, the woman at the hotel said we should stop at the state park. And I think you'll find this quite impressive. We are in uh, western Washington, which has a terrain that is very different than what we came out of, of the Rocky Mountains. This is a very flat, dry, grassy area of open plains. You can see this area up here. That grass that you see is pretty much what predominates the whole area around here as we were drove probably 50 miles from the border of Idaho and Washington. However, we're in a park called Palouse State Park, which is a small uh, park. But as I turn this around here, you're going to see something rather amazing, which is a cavern cut out of the rock because of great floods. And hopefully you can get to see this. And you see that waterfall. So there is a river. The Snake River is not far from here in the Palouse River, but has found its way into those crevices. And as you see, falls into a huge pool down at the bottom. And this looks almost like the Grand Canyon, which uh, we've been to before. But as you see farther to the right, as I turn this around, the glaciers and floods have just carved a huge ravine, a gorge, through here. And I don't know if I can get to see this because I can't keep this video on too long. Um, but basically, what you're seeing is one of nature's great sculptures. Palouse State Park. You can actually hike down to the bottom of this if you wanted to. Uh, the lady at the hotel told us about this place. It was also in our book, but um, she did it. Uh, we will not do this. It's uh, about a mile down, half a mile, maybe a half a mile down, and a half a mile back up. Thought you might enjoy it, guys. That's quite impressive. Uh, so this, so when we came out of the park, we went down towards the Snake River, which is now we're on the western side of the of the Rockies, <clears throat> and we came to a spot, which was what as I described here, um, a Lewis and Clark spot. We are uh, at the, what they use the term out here, confluence or meeting of two rivers. So what you're seeing right now is the Palouse River, which is a small river that comes out of the, the hills. And it's merging into the Snake River, which is the larger of the two. You can't see too much of the snake to the right because the hill's in the way. But uh, I'm going to pan around here. And there's a bridge here, which did not exist in 1803, by the way. Um, that, uh, that other bridge is a train trestle that goes all the way across the river. But the Snake River is the large river as you're looking at it. And Lewis and Clark did pass by here as they went downriver. They had the advantage of uh, going downstream towards the Columbia, which is about uh, 50 or 60 miles away. But uh, this is a Lewis and Clark spot at some point in 1805, around October or so, they passed by this spot. So we wanted to note it, record it, and we got to move on. So we stayed in a motel. This guy was over our bed. <laughs> uh, kind of impressive uh, animal. Um, so talking about Astoria, 
Uh, so when they came all the way down, I have you know a number of shots of the Columbia River, which is a very long river. It's probably even wider than the Hudson River. Um, and it empties out into, into the Pacific. But so when they came down that river and they came to the Pacific, and we'll show you another uh, video about that. They set up shop here for about four months. They came here in about November, 1805. And uh, they built a, a little campsite, if you will. This is a recreation of some of the cabins that they actually built to withstand the winter. We were talking before, it rained almost 80% of the time of that winter from 1805, 1806, it rained incessantly. And storms would come off the Pacific Ocean and uh, hit the Oregon and Washington coast. This is a painting. Uh, they met all kinds of different uh, you know, Native American tribes along the Columbia River. They traded with them, bought them food. They would give them trinkets and you know, return for other things. You know, keep in mind that along the Pacific uh, Ocean, a lot of fur traders from different countries, Russia, uh, Spain, France, would actually come into the Columbia River from going uh, eastbound and would trade with the various you know, you know, Native American tribes at that time. This is a recreation of the entire, what's called Fort Clatsop, which is a National Historic Center. So we finally get to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we're at the mouth of the Columbia River. It's a Corps of Engineers site. That's a kind of a deck that you can go out and see the ocean. And we'll have one more video here in a minute uh, with George. But here we reach on our ninth day or so to get to the, uh, to the mouth of the Columbia and the Pacific. Well, here we are folks, end of the road. What you're looking at is the other side of the Columbia River. And at the end of that beach area is where the Columbia's mouth is, the very beginning of it as far as where it meets the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> We're standing on the beach at the most western point right here in Oregon. And as you can tell from the crashing waves, this is the Pacific Ocean. We've traveled over 2,000 miles to replicate the journey of the Corps of Discovery, and we have made it. As you see it, that's due west out into the ocean. On the other side is what's called Cape Disappointment, which is across the bay. I'm standing on the southern side of uh, the land in Oregon where they were, about 15 miles to the uh, east of here is where Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery built a settlement for uh, their time here during the winter of 1805-1806 from November through March to uh, hang out here for the winter time before they made their trek going back east in March, April of 1806, back over the mountains and across the Missouri down to St. Louis. It's been a great journey. We'll have a bunch of pictures. The Ryan and I will, uh, will bump chests just to say that we made it together. And I uh, hope you had a fun, uh, you know, watching us do it just as much as we did doing it itself. I was putting, you know, daily updates of our journey on Facebook. So a lot of people were following us as we went along. That's what I was talking about, uh, you know, when I was put back there. So uh, that was me just looking uh, up. And one of the things, as you might imagine, we both have scruffy beards. So we said we weren't going to shave until we got to the Pacific Ocean. And we did. So, th that, so those are nine day growths. I mean, so Ryan put uh, his, our little mark in the sand there in, uh, you can see that August 27, 2015. This actually is William Clark's 
handwriting that he carved into a stone, uh, what's called Pompey's Pillar in Montana. As you can see in July 25th, 1806 on their way back from the Pacific Ocean. And this has been you know, documented, validated study that this is actually Clark's signature. It's actually in the journals too. Uh, so we thought it was kind of nice to kind of put it together. Um, but you can actually see this at the national site in Montana. This just tells you a little bit of what the trip was. So we celebrated. Uh, so we were not far from Portland, Oregon. We stayed in Portland that night. Uh, we went to the best restaurant we could find, which is the top of an office building. And uh, we celebrated our trip uh, the day after. We caught a plane the following day. Ryan went to San Francisco where he was working on a project. And uh, I met my wife down in LA where we were going to a wedding. Um, and then we took some time uh, to see the West. One little anecdote about, so we were served by a young fellow and we, and we got to talk to him. So this is Portland, Oregon, right? And I said, you know, you know by the way, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Danbury, Connecticut. <laughs> Look at that, right? What are the odds of me seeing somebody from Danbury 3,000 miles away? Uh, but they moved. Uh, so what happened to Lewis and Clark after this? Uh, Clark probably had a more significant and meaningful life uh, experiences afterwards. He became kind of the governor of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, you, know, you know, Jefferson appointed him that. There was a lot of fanfare with this, obviously. When they got back to St. Louis, everybody was celebrating their return. And uh, within a year or so, uh, he became, I think it was, uh, the governor of that large piece of territory. Lewis, uh, who um, was a kind of private assistant to Thomas Jefferson in the White House before he went on the trip, they're both military men, but he suffered from, back in those days, they call it melancholia, uh, which is really depression. And Jefferson writes about it. And unfortunately, uh, about a year, a couple of years after this, he took his own life in uh, Kentucky in some sort of a, what we would call a kind of a bed and breakfast, uh, a tavern that had some, you know, roots that he was found dead there. Some scholars think that he might've been murdered, but there's really no significant evidence to that effect. But he, for some reason, uh, was depressed enough to, uh, to take his own life. But uh, they were celebrated and have been celebrated ever since, uh, since that time. Uh, just, I put this slide together to show you the very, these are various museums, interpretive centers, uh, all kinds of sites at the state level, the federal level, or even at the local level uh, that you can see along the way. And I don't know how many there are there, but you know, there's quite a few of them. I do want, you know, Ryan, to just to read the last part. You can imagine after being out uh, on this trip for 18 months, uh, when they went to the Pacific Ocean and having seen the Bitterroot Mountains and the disappointment that they went through to that. When they finally got on the Columbia, I don't know how many miles, but their journals talk about that they could start to smell the salt air coming in from the ocean, maybe five miles out. And uh, Clark writes very passionately about his experience, as passionate as, as the two of them were. They weren't terribly passionate, but anyway, uh, this is from their journals. So. This is from the journal, uh, November 7, 1805. Uh, great joy in the camp. We are in view of the ocean. Oh, the joy, this great Pacific Ocean, which has been so long anxious to see. And the roaring noise made by the waves breaking on the rocky shores may be heard distinctly. Ocean 4,142 miles from the mouth of the Missouri River, which is the starting point of the journey. So they spent the whole winter there uh, from 05 to 06 and around March or so started their way back. Obviously they knew uh, what their route was. They also had other guides that, that took them across. They made the trip back to St. Louis in about six months. So it took them one third the amount of time to go back than it took them to get there. Not surprisingly, but still six months was quite a journey. And from that point forward, uh, they also took uh, a lot of documentation about plants, animals that they had never seen before. 
Uh, you know, prairie dogs were never, in effect, never known uh, to people on the East Coast. A prairie dogs are these little, like, you know, rodent-like squirrels that come out of the holes in the plains. Uh, we actually saw some of them when we were in the uh, in Theodore Roosevelt Park. Um, but a whole bunch of flora and fauna that they actually documented uh, as part of their navigation of the trip. So that's pretty much it. I, I you know, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we have to take.